Before we get started in this episode, a quick announcement. As you know, I'm very passionate about acceptance and commitment therapy and I also run a busy practice in Canberra. We're currently looking for psychologists who are registered in Australia to join our team who are also passionate about learning about ACT. We provide supervision on a group and individual basis and training around ACT. So if this is you, if you're interested, please express your interest at strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers. Look forward to hearing from you. And now back to this episode. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. My name is Nesh Nikolic and my guest today is Michael Jewig, who is an educational and developmental psychologist with postgraduate training in educational and developmental psychology and health management. While completing his studies, Michael developed his clinical skills in government and non-government sectors, specifically focused on children and youth mental health and child development. Michael has experience in counselling children and adolescents experiencing a range of difficulties, including anxiety, depression, emotional and behavioural regulation difficulties, trauma, and relationship issues. Being heavily involved in sport and a former international rugby union player, Michael weaves physical activity into engaging his clients to benefit them. Michael is also proficient in academic and cognitive assessments. But when he's not practicing clinically, he is the clinical research manager at the Center for Clinical Trials in Rare Neurodevelopmental Disorders at the Queensland Children's Hospital. In this position, Michael oversees multiple clinical trials assessing the efficacy of novel pharmacological agents for rare disorders, including Fragile X Syndrome, Prader-Willi Syndrome, uh, Rett Disorder or Syndrome, and ASD. Similarly, Michael holds an associate lecturer appointment at the University of Queensland and has presented lectures for both domestic and international audiences. Michael has a keen interest in research and has published several articles relating to child and youth mental health and child development. Michael is also a panel member for the Mental Health Scholarship Scheme for Allied Health Professionals within Queensland Health and the former state chair for the College of Educational and Developmental Psychologists in Queensland. Today, we discuss medicinal cannabis trials and research and his work in really trying to support young children with novel pharmacological uh, agents to support better health and well-being, not only for children, but also for their families. And a really interesting conversation today. I certainly learned a lot and I hope you enjoy today's episode too. Michael, a big thank you for coming onto the show today. I've been excited to, to talk to you because there's, there's some topics that I you know, am quite interested in uh, and I know that something that you're you know, working in and are interested in as well. So thank you for coming on today. Mate, my pleasure. Uh, when yourself and the team first reached out, I was, you know, a little bit anxious about what little old Michael Dewey could contribute with some of your uh, previous guests, with uh, a good friend of mine, Joe Coyne, and obviously, you know, some of the other uh, names there, Michael Carr, Greg, for example, are, are sort of people that I look up to. So uh, I sort of lent into that anxiety, and I guess here we are. Look, it's uh, it's exciting as, as as psychs, as fellow psychs, and I know that you have a you know, educational developmental uh, psych, you know, perspective. It's interesting to chew the fat and, and and to learn from one another. So you know, appreciate you coming on, and in particular to talk about. Uh, I know you've got you know, numerous passions, but in particular, you know, looking at clinical trials and and you know, medicinal cannabis. You know, I'm I'm, I'm not too well versed in in this space uh, and although i've done a little bit of research and you know i like the, the, the this new space that's coming you know, to australia and i think the world it looks like that way anyway is looking at how you know psychedelic assisted uh, therapy you know can be can be useful mm. so um yeah keen keen to uh, find out more in the you know world of cannabis perfect hopefully i can try and you know uh, add some wisdom to that area for us Maybe maybe we could just start in in terms of you know how you got into uh, you know this space and, and and maybe even talk about you know your current work. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess currently I'm a clinical research manager uh, at the Queensland Children's Hospital. Uh, our team has this really long-winded name called the Centre for Clinical Trials in Rare Neurodevelopmental Disorders. Um, we tried to you know, make a fancy name or work out a fancy acronym, but um, unfortunately we couldn't come up with a plan, so we just sort of stuck with that. Um, and I guess our overall remit is to service uh, children and families with rare neurodevelopmental disorders and try and put them in touch with, uh, I guess, pharmaceutical companies or sponsors that may be looking to uh, assess whether their novel or new uh, medication works for a particular symptom or a particular, I guess, problem or concern uh, within kids with these with these rare conditions. I mean, that's... Uh... It's a you know incredible service to be looking at because you know it sounds like this is the fundamental you know, building blocks of how we go out and not only support you know young people in particular but you know learn about how to do it most effectively with you know clinical trials and and doing it in a safe you know, manner as well because there are you know lots of you know, lots of needs, but at the same mm. time, you know, there are plenty of opportunities, but they need to be looked at and examined with, you know, with science, you know, in, 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 a, in a clinical way. And I think places like Australia are, are uh, you know, amazing to do this because I know our protocols and ethics are very strong. So, you know, it's lovely to hear, hear that and, you know, uh, be a part of that world stage. Um, and how did you get into the cannabis space? Is that is that currently something that is is being studied at the moment mm. so uh, actually it's a it's a it's a long-winded story but quite a, a good one essentially is that um <clears throat> i think about four to five years ago uh our premier sort of put together a bit of a, a budget and a task force to look at uh the medicinal cannabis sort of therapy um after i think some of her colleagues down in victoria also uh, announced a plan and i think um she wanted to kind of beat them to the punch per se and so our team here at the Children's Hospital um, got a sort of large amount of funding uh, to collaborate with uh, GW Pharmaceuticals uh, to look at medicinal cannabis, specifically, I guess, their product Epidiolex um, in the sort of uh, refractory epilepsy space to see if that was going to be of benefit to those children who had tried sort of, you know, first and second line treatments uh, for their refractory epilepsy. Uh, to see if this was going to be, uh, I guess, of benefit to them. Um, <clears throat> and so from that funding, we actually started our centre, uh, I think it was back in 2017. Um, I was lucky enough to sort of be a part of the team in, in a uh, psychologist capacity, um, looking at, you know, various parent assessments, quality of life, some functional assessments and that sort of thing for those kids with uh, Dravé and lennox Gasto um, epilepsies. Um, and since then, we've sort of taken on, you know, between five to, you know, I think we're batting at about 10 other clinical trials at the moment now. And we've expanded outside of that medicinal cannabis type of, uh, you know, remit or medication to look at really <coughs> any sort of novel therapy for kids with rare neuro disorders. Maybe we can start, if you don't mind, uh, of, of going through some of the research that you've done in that you know, epilepsy world um, because it's something that I've certainly heard of I think it's fairly mainstream that mm. uh, you know uh, when children in particular with ep- epilepsy have trialed lots of different interventions that that have I'm not going to say failed because I think that's the wrong word but have not provided the affect that the you know family and, 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 and the medical system are hoping mm. for the child mm-hmm. that um, you know these trials have been considered uh, and you know, antidotally, I've you know you only hear one or one or the other side, and 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 that's the sad thing. There there seems to be, you know, extremes for or extremes against. So maybe you can tell us about, you know, what is the research? What does it say? You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know how efficacious is it? You know, and it, maybe if you can talk about you know how it's even delivered and and mm-hmm. um, you know how that's been changed. What are the dosages and so on? That would be you know mm-hmm. exciting for me to, to, to understand more about. <laughs> No, that'd be fine. I guess uh, I need to preface this with, you know, with the epilepsies, this is definitely, you know, in the space of our, our colleagues in uh, the neurology team um, and as ourselves as sort of a clinical trial unit embedded with that. Um, it, this isn't sort of standard clinical care for these kids. So we only really 
um, see these kids when they get brought on to these clinical trials. And, you know, this particular sure. clinical trial has finished up. Um, so I can't, I guess, give away uh, too much information when it comes to, you know, the efficacy or some of those outcomes because we're still currently in the process of, you know, marketing approvals, et cetera, uh, with, with GW. But um, I guess as a psychologist working in this space, it's definitely, you know, uh, it gives you those warm and fuzzies just to see some of the, the benefits um, that these families see. Um, you know, we're kind of on the cutting edge of, you know, translational medicine where you go from these things working, you know, in a laboratory or with, um, you know, animal models, et cetera, moving right through to sort of first in human type um, instances and seeing, you know, some of the potential benefits that these families do receive is, you know, like I said, gives you those warm and fuzzy. So um, as a psychologist at the coalface, you know, in a clinic setting where sort of we're talking through, I guess, various uh, psychotherapies that can help with things like anxiety and depression. Whilst that's really fulfilling, seeing some of these, um, like I said, the outcomes for these families and that, you know, the benefits that they do see in some instances um, really, you know, makes you want to come to work bright and early in the morning and get stuck in and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of some of the research uh, in, in relation to the sort of the refractory epilepsies, to be honest with you, I'm not too across that. Um, because we, we sort of left that in the hands of the neurologists and, and we purely sort of did the assessments and, and those sorts of things. Um, and now that, like I said, that trial's finished up, we're sort of man manoeuvring more or pivoting a little bit more into sort of the medicinal cannabis in the sort of developmental uh, conditions such as, you know, autism, fragile X. Uh, what else do we have? Yeah, we have actually a couple of autism trials using uh, medicinal cannabis and our longest running trial is in sort of the Fragile X cohorts. And I think we're coming up to sort of the fourth year of servicing those patients and their families. And how, how do you go about conducting these? What are the measures that you're you know, assessing, you know, pre, pre, um, you know, therapy or dosing um, or mm -hmm. intervention? Uh, how, how, how do we kind of um, go? How are you guys gauging, gauging mm -hmm. that? How's that all set up? Well, this is actually, you know, as a psychologist, it's really cool, right? Because if we look at our colleagues in oncology uh, and those other disciplines, they've been doing clinical trials for the best part of, you know, 10 to 20 years now. So, you now essentially, if you're diagnosed with a form of cancer, there are a handful of clinical trials that you can sort of roll into from there. Um, and we've sort of taken a leaf out of, you know, that book and seen the, I guess, the overall or the population sort of base benefits of uh, clinical trials and the science that it yields and trying to really adapt that into, I guess, our space in the developmental disorder space um, and seeing what benefits it can yield. So the, the great thing about being a psychologist in this area is that there is no blood test for anxiety. There's no blood test for depression. So you need our expertise to assess whether that, you know, that's an increase in anxiety has resulted in, you know, some really big changes in day-to-day -day behavior, school refusal, you know, being more irritable and, and those sorts of uh, daily functioning concerns that mums and dads uh, have quite often. Um, so to answer your original question, uh, the I guess the, the, the tool that we use most commonly is called um, the Aberrant Behaviour Checklist or the ABC. Um, I think this is quite a dated assessment. Um, I think it was, you know, created back in the 80s um, and I think the blokes that, are, that created are still making quite a lot of money off it good on them um, and I guess the reason why I think this one is the most commonly used is that um, risperidone was kind of uh, marketed or approved I think is the correct term uh, for, for kids with autism based on a significant decrease in the irritability subscale of this particular assessment so um, I guess the gift and the curse of collaborating with sponsors is that their sort of focus is on, you know, patient welfare and improving the lives of these, these kids and families, but also um, they've got a board and a bottom line to answer to. Um, and so they're trying to get their product to market and available to the wider public. Uh, whereas I guess our, our team, um, we're sitting there trying to connect, I guess, these sponsors with these families in need in order to benefit the families as well as the sponsors in that regard. It complicates things, doesn't it? And hence why there's always an <clears> elephant <throat> in the room in these, in these sort of conversations. And, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, cannabis or, you know, respiridone or anything like that, there, 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 there's always a question about 
uh, you know, how do we do this appropriately? And and I know, you know, especially from a, a political front, there's a great fear and and um, I think apprehension about looking at you know things that we traditionally call drugs or at least mainstream drugs. You know, and mm. you know, cannabis, for example, has been you know, talked about or even labelled as like the gateway. Mm -hmm. drug you know which makes it so frightening you know we tell everyone you're allowed to go out and use it you know if you go into the military you get questioned as to whether you've ever gone out and used um you know marijuana it's it's mm -hmm. it's something that's readily available so a lot of kids in you know year 11 year 12 start being exposed to this sort of stuff in in, in you know party environments and and, mm -hmm. and so on which you know it's a lot more accessible. And, and, and so, you know, there's a fear about abuse or, you know, I mean, for me, I, I always think about it in terms of, you know, maybe every drug or every substance can be medicinal. You know, if we just look at it from a, a functional analysis perspective, does it help? Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think life is a lot more complicated because, you know, there are inadvertent messages that can go out. And if something is easily accessible, i.e., you know, uh, cannabis or you know, marijuana, someone might go out and say, well, I'm not paying for the medicinal stuff. You know, I've, I've known how this works, you know, and I, I will use it myself. Right. And so yeah. you know, bad things can come from, from that. And, and, you know, in some sense, medicine is trying to establish that there is a, you know, a clinical way to do this an appropriate way that doesn't necessarily get it right, but it goes through trial and error. Mm -hmm. uh, and even when you're with the GP, the GP is going through trial and error as well. You know, you start mm -hmm. with one dose, examine it. It's not giving the the, the effect that we want. So we might increase the dose, re -de -re, mm -hmm. you know, re reduce the dose, mm -hmm. change it all together and say that doesn't even work for you. We're going to go yeah. on to option C, D. Or a side effect or an adverse event. And, you know, Absolutely. That's, that's, you know, we're we're trying to use it as a medicine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. And it's um, really bridging that gap between, I guess, the scientific methodology of, of what we do here in a clinical trials unit versus, you know, what happens, you know, out in the community or, or things sort of, you know, being accessed privately or off-label, et cetera. So what we do know is that, you know, I speak for our team here at the Children's Hospital, we are definitely against any product that has THC in it. Um, all of our products here are purely a sort of a CBD which is the cannabidiol uh, cannabinoid, one of the 526 found in medicinal cannabis. So um, the two sort of uh, solutions that we use here is one is Epidiolex and that's sort of an oral solution that's just in a pipette on the tongue. Um, and then the other one that we use is a product uh, which is a transdermal gel that's applied to the skin and then sort of uh, enters the body via the sort of uh, the, the skin application there. Um, and the beauty of those two products is that they are um, yeah, all CBD. So, you know, our doctors here that prescribe it um, are very sort of aware of, you know, some of the um, issues with issuing young people and, you know, old people as well with um, a product that contains THC uh, and the propensity for, you know, people to develop sort of psychosis and potentially schizophrenia from there. Can you talk us through the difference between THC and, and CBD? Because we often talk about, um, you know, cannabis as being, you know, for example, just smoking marijuana and so mm -hmm. off, off you go and, and you know, mm -hmm. we don't see the differences of, of how medicinal marijuana is very different to, mm -hmm. to um, uh, you know, like, you know, CBD is different to THC. So can you talk us through, through that and, and why there's a clear distinction and, and the importance of that? Mm. I can try. I can try my best. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Uh, so what we know is, I guess, THC is the psychoactive component of medicinal cannabis. And that's where, I guess, users get the high is from that particular um, cannabinoid. Um, and I guess that the research tells us that there are several sort of downstream negative consequences of using, uh, I guess, any product containing THC, like I explained before with the psychosis and the schizophrenia, et cetera. Um, Whereas with the cannabidiol or the CBD component, like I said, there's about 526 odd cannabinoids within medicinal cannabis. Um, the, the sponsors have synthesized that single uh, cannabinoid out. And we see that as being, I guess, the most beneficial for, uh, you know, humans in general. You can see now that 
within sort of elite sports, there's this, and I wouldn't have a clue what the evidence base is behind it, um, some CBD sort of ointments or balms for neuroinflammation, for muscle soreness, um, for, you know, uh, rest, recovery and sleep and those sorts of things. Um, so it seems like the vast majority of, I guess, the scientific literature, as well as, you know, the the anecdotal comments out there in the community is looking at the benefits of the CBD product in isolation. Maybe it's also a marketing thing where it should be, you know, just spoken about as a, you know, trials with CBD rather than medicinal marijuana because people can't distinguish the, you know, at least the lay person. And then there's all mm-hmm. this kind of fear factor and all this nonsense mm-hmm. that goes on, uh, goes on mm-hmm. uh, which would probably be no different to saying, you know, we're, we're testing, uh, you know, poisonous toads. And, you know, the truth is we're probably grabbing a toad and, you know, removing one specific component out of, out of the poison and then trying to synthesize that and, and then using that. But if we go out and tell, tell the media and, and, and publicize mm-hmm. it that way, everyone's frightened of giving their children, you know, poisonous it's toad um, product. You know, it wouldn't yeah. make sense. Um, so, you know, it's almost like saying medicinal poison. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and, <laughs> that's counterintuitive as that sounds yes yeah um, yeah and in actual i mean we know that some of these things are poisons per se because if you have too much of them they can they can harm but we're saying you know there is you know, a balance between you know, what, 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 what's effective useful beneficial versus you know maybe the side effects or or um you know, the, the other things that come with that mm, no I, I agree i don't think um you know, because we our center sort of started around the same time as um, cannabis was legalized in, in you know America, Colorado, those sorts of states, um, and so there was a lot of confusion around. Oh, uh, you know, is medicinal cannabis just the good stuff, and you get it from a dispensary as opposed to, you know, a, a medical grade type? Uh, in our instance, for the the gel, a, a synthetic formulation that has gone through sort of a rigorous process in order to you know, be certified and, and that sort of thing to be used in our clinical trials. Um, there's a really, you know, big distinction between, I guess, those two offerings. And um, I guess that's what makes the medicinal cannabis field uh, very tricky to navigate, but also um, very uh, exciting to be a part of is that um, we've kind of gone about this backwards, right? We've we've seen some of, you know, the anecdotal type of um it's not really research, but some of the findings that have been, you know, popular across the internet and that sort of thing where, you know, families, uh, you know, within Australia, outside of Australia have used um, cannabis to, to good effect uh, for certain, you know, conditions and, and, and symptoms. The, the one that springs to mind and some of the, the videos that have done the rounds particularly uh, uh, is a case out of Israel where there was quite a, a young uh, boy with autism uh, that was quite... Uh, had significant impairments with day-to-day life um, and anecdotally they prescribed uh, medicinal cannabis to this boy and it was this miraculous recovery it was like he was a different person Um, and so a lot of I guess um, families have tried to seek out this same outcome um, whether it's through a centre like ours in a clinical trial or whether it's through you know friends of friends and, and sort of pointing people in the right direction to get it um, I don't want to say illegally, but not legally uh, in that instance. Um, and so, you know, the, the, there is a, a belief out there that this can really help children uh, and young people with certain conditions. So now we're sort of backtracking and going about it in a bit of a scientific, rigorous way so we can actually see if there is, you know, a benefit. And if there is, does it outweigh, I guess, the cons, the the adverse events um, and, and some of the other things that we may see along the way in that journey. And and, and, and that's part of the, the issue. I know that one of my friends when he was in late stages uh, or at least, you know, maybe halfway through his, his um, journey with cancer, you know, the, the volume of medication that he was taking, you know, that included you know, benzos and mm. opioids and you know, yeah, it's a other, concoction. Other, 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 other medications, you know, you know, I think sometimes it's called the holy trinity in drug sort of uh, user space. Um, mm-hmm. You know, was was 
either not achieving what it was supposed to do, or if it did, it meant he was sleeping and, and that mm. meant no quality of life. It meant that he couldn't see his children who you know, he had very little time to, to, you know, spare with. Mm. And I know that he did access um, uh, some type of, um, I think it was an oil uh, or, or something from a, from a colleague or, or, or someone or rather that, 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 um, you know, support him in that and and you know he explained to me how much relief it gave him um, mm. from a, from a pain perspective how that works i have no idea uh, mm-hmm. but he would just consume it orally um and and he said it was you know he would use it sparingly mm-hmm. but it mean, meant that he could actually be present with his family when when he needed to um uh, and you know it was only from time the time so obviously it didn't have a perfect affect because otherwise i'm sure he would be he would you know, abandon the other stuff and just mm. that. but he said it, it, it supported him um now that's an antidotal uh thing but once again mm. you know, it almost speaks to that scenario where if it works for one person everyone else kind of jumps on it and and, and you know obviously frightening things can come from that but at the same mm. time it needs to be invest- investigated because mm-hmm. Now, if you're a parent um, or you know, uh, part of a family and you see young children in agony and pain, especially spaces where you know, might be seizures or mm-hmm. epilepsy or oncology world, mm-hmm. if there's anything that can help human beings. We're desperate. This is why, you know, snake oil salesmen can sell us anything. You know, where- well, correct. It's, it's, you know, in that instance, it's definitely playing on the vulnerable, but you know, to use your example of your your friend that sort of uh, you know went through these trials and tribulations with their their medication, etc. You know, all I guess not good science, but science stems from those anecdotal reports of like, oh, this worked and this didn't. So then that's a sort of you know the precipice of, of further development and further research, and you know, in our world, sort of clinical trials. And you know, does this benefit the participant or the patient more than? you know, uh, the cons involved or, you know, will this work for this particular group and not that particular group? And these are all really good uh, questions that we we as a team strive to answer. What do you think are the the, the current challenges that faces you know, uh, cannabis and, and these trials? You know, what, what, what are the sticking points? Oh, I mean, there, there's there's a bit of a litany of, of tricky parts and sticky points and that sort of thing. It's, I think, one of the big issues that we're running into is, uh, and I mean rightly so, is is the need for um, the safety aspect uh, for these young people, these children, and and the need for blood tests. Um, so obviously, you know, compounds like uh, CBD, they can you know make your blood results a little bit wonky, and we need to make sure that you know, everything's sort of staying in line with what is best practice. And if there are issues, then, you know, obviously we refer those to our doctors and they treat it accordingly. Um, The tricky bit is, particularly with our ASD cohorts, is that they are so, you know, adverse to any type of blood test, to any type of, you know, sensory issue. Um, You know, we have a full, we have a full team here of, you know, doctors, psychologists, nurses, study coordinators, um, and even getting blood pressure readings on these kids to a really, really difficult task. So um, some of the challenges are, you know, those mandatory safety things that you have to do, which, which is fine. That They're there for a reason and they're, they're there to keep people safe. But it also means that potentially the people that need this help or uh, that need to sort of see if this works for their young person the most won't be able to access these trials purely from, you know, a safety perspective, which makes you know, life very tri- tricky for these families. It's uh, such a simple problem, yet so destructive in that for young people, obviously getting a needle needle is, is you know, can be <coughs> absolutely, mm-hmm. ex- you know, excruciating and, and, and the yeah, fear. Traumatic. And, I mean, no sure. one, especially children, but no one wants to have an object that, you know, penetrates their skin and you know, mm-hmm. breaks their flesh open and, and, mm-hmm. and it's extremely painful and and, mm-hmm. and it hurts and they don't get it right all the time because mm-hmm. 
you know, the body is complicated. So yeah, correct. And especially when kids are squirming and they're, you know, tensing and all sorts of stuff. So yeah. that's a real pain point because to do it safely, you've got to get lots of blood tests, you know, regularly. And, and that, that would, I, I imagine lots of parents end up abandoning uh, the process because the side effect of the, um, for lack of a better word, I'm going to say trauma, but it's mm. the wrong word for, for the distress is probably the right yeah. word for the distress that it brings the child. And then obviously brings the family just becomes mm. greater than um, the potential benefit of yeah. being on the trial. And this is a tricky part, right? So we're, one of our inclusion criteria across all of our trials is being able to complete a blood test. So in some ways it's really self-selecting in terms of we're getting the kids that, you know, are either, um, you know, on the, on, the, on the spectrum but high functioning and they're able to sort of sit with that distress enough or we're getting the super small kids that can sort of sit on mum and dad's lap and, you know, unfortunately sort of be restrained uh, for a wee bit of time to, to make this all happen. Or, you know, conversely, in, in some of the other conditions that we do um, sort of see in, in the clinical trial world, um, some of the kids, they have, you know, the ability to just stick their arm out and then go for it. So it's very, you know, horses for courses and subjective when it comes to uh, the clinical trials and being able to complete these safety assessments. It's incredible that we don't have something today that, you know, can be safely, repeatedly mm -hmm. done to, you know, knock kids out or, you know, even adults to say, mm -hmm. we're knocking mm -hmm. you out for, you know, 30 seconds. And yeah. you know, that's the time to get the needle in and at mm -hmm. least start drawing the blood. Then we wake yeah. you up and we, we can yeah. you know, fill up our tubes as much as we like because there's no more pain or at least very minimal. Mm -hmm. uh, we just don't have it yet that, that, that I suppose, uh, has, has, has received approval to say that it's safe and long term, yeah. so it's repeatable. You know, obviously, and we you know, we do this mo much more commonly. I mean, we do it even for kids when they're having dental procedures that previously wasn't you know, near as, as readily available. Uh, yeah, but, correct. Uh, it feels like, you know, the, the more could be available to, mm. to, to assist families, you know, because it wouldn't be an abuse thing because no one's abusing blood tests. No one yeah. <laughs> just trying Please, to... Please, give me more. <laughs> oh, gosh. And th this is the tricky part. And this is, you know, one of the other, I guess, concerns that we have is that, um, you know, if a young person presents to emergency with, you know, an accident or something, there are several methods of you know sedation that one of the you know the, the families or the doctors can use in that in that scenario but you know us in the research world because this is you know research and, and not a sort of a clinical setting uh, we have to play by a different set of rules so that makes you know uh, for our center sedation just out of the question which you know can be tricky um you know letting some families know that the reason that they can't participate is because you know a you know, little person can't uh, give blood and that's a, a mandatory requirement without any assistance in that regard. Uh, and we know that that's not the case across Australia. So different centres, different, you know, research units will have different rules that they play by. But, you know, for us here in Brisbane, that's sort of the rule that we sort of uh, have to just play the game by, unfortunately. It's interesting because I know in Canberra here, you know, uh, my, my, my daughter's had um, some medical procedures and, I think it's a resourcing issue that, uh, you know, not enough people on the floor and, and it mm. requires more uh, monitoring. You know, the Correct. moment you go out and give anything to a child, especially a child, uh, there, there's greater accountability. Maybe there's mm. lower tolerances to those sorts of things for children. Um, and so to actually get, get to that, you know, you have to have stuck a needle in you know, a child's arm and mm. not being successful. And then you've had to try, you know, gas you know which then requires you know six people yep. in the room um mm -hmm. and sign off and so on and so forth people so on it, standby yeah correct you know it's a big ordeal by that by that time so it's a, it's a real tricky one uh, mm -hmm. for for something that you know the the, the is, is so commonplace uh yeah but, outside you know, of sort of that the, the research setting i mean if to, to your listeners out there if anyone's got any ideas on how i can get a a liver function test done on a, a you know a, a needle prick or something like that please shout out and get in touch because that would make our life a whole lot easier i mean what what wasn't that the uh it was a theranos theranos was the uh, uh <laughs> the um <clears throat> the, the 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 system that was going to solve it all that yeah you know, I, I think that like. young lady is um you know behind bars at the moment so yeah we'll 
Yeah, but, uh, sorry, I should preface that with a um, an evidence based one that works. That would be fabulous. Cheers. Yeah, yeah but look, that 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 demonstrates how much of a holy grail that would be. That if you could go out and get you know, a tiny amount of blood and yeah. go out and, and and do this in this portable capacity, mm. the change that would make to medicine. You know, the, oh, that we could just overnight go out as well. Huge yeah, it would leaps, be amazing you know, because it, it would mean that. You know, if it wasn't so intrusive, you could do it so freak. And you know what? You can not only do it so frequently with with your clinical trials. Imagine just general mm-hmm. uh, uh, medicine. Like you'd, yeah. you'd be taking blood tests all the time for mm-hmm. you know just checking and and data data collection would go up oh, and you could take routine medicine and monitoring. Go, yeah, yeah it would be above. phenomenal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you could automate it. It'd zap to a database somewhere. An algorithm would run the checks. Two seconds later, you've got a notification on your phone. Oh, yeah, Michael, you know, you shouldn't have eaten that pork on the weekend. Your cholesterol's up. You better get yourself to the GP and, and sort it out. Like, it would be, you know, pretty cool. It's almost like those, 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 those systems that uh, I know that some people can have them. I think they are on the skin. but they, uh, uh, Yes, um, the, the, the people with diabetes and yeah, the insulin yeah. levels and those sorts of things, yeah. I mean, obviously, they've got to prick themselves all the time. So, you know, mm. they, they would take the pain of one. I, mean, I don't even know how they work, but, you know, that would be the holy grail, especially for kids to go out yeah. and say, you know, if you've got some medical you know, difficulties, let's do this, you know, once a month or however mm. long they can last for. And, and, and you know, especially from a trial basis, you could take such regular, yeah. regular, um, you know, data points to, to inform, mm-hmm. you know, what, what would be effective. And this is the thing would move to, you know, preventative medicine instead of reactive medicine, which I think would be amazing. Yeah. yeah. What is the data that then, I mean, I'm not sure whether you can speak to this as well, but uh, for kids with ASD, uh, yeah. has anything come out yet that that, that has been, um, you know, publicised about you know, the use of CBD for, for you know, managing, yeah. I'm assuming, the distress, the difficulties, um, you know, the, some of the behavioural things that can sometimes occur with with that population Mm. this seems to be the area that sort of medicinal cannabis and cbd is moving towards is sort of that asd space and um i think that the the majority of the literature as it currently stands is out of israel um and some of the research centers that they have there and i guess that's because um their government may or may not own their medicinal cannabis uh stores and and crops and supplies um, but, you know, I think there's a, a couple of uh, RCTs with low numbers that have in, been done to show, you know, a, a good effect, uh, particularly around aggression and irritability. Um, but it's kind of, uh, I guess, being in this space, it's how do we map those, I guess, behavioural characteristics to then some sort of, you know, um, you know, teacher reported data or another third person or, or some sort of, you know, biological type assessment so that you can really sort of marry up the, you know, mum and dad's perspective, yet cool his anxieties down. We can then look at potentially some eye tracking type um, assessments to see that, yeah, you know, his eye tracking is actually reduced and that's come down. So that's in line with a reduction in the anxiety as well. And then move that to sort of potentially a classroom based thing to say, you know, um, the young person's actually been um, able to sort of, you know, be calmer within the classroom. Um, you know, little Timmy or little Tina has been really good this week. They've been learning. They've been asking questions. And how do we get, I guess, those sort of across context type assessments done to really show that something like a, a CBD is working well across all of those settings? So I think that's the that that's that's the holy the, the mecca that we're trying to get to. Mm-hmm. Um, because if, if that sort of is, is the case, then I can just see that, you know, CBD in particular um, will be something that, you know, other people that uh, parents, clinicians, uh, other researchers may consider, you know, putting a bit more uh, thought into in the future. It's really challenging. You're almost talking about trying to do something that, you know, controls for extraneous variables and, and obviously has, you know, repeat measures from, various persons to validate because obviously you know parents can you know i mean look you know just placebo effect um you know, yeah 20 percent uh, bang uh, done it works so you go. <clears throat> yeah, yeah yeah you know it's it's like this is great let's let, let, let's proceed versus going out and seeing this longitudinally mm. um because i think a lot of things can appear to be very effective um you know just through placebo and obviously you know 
good ISCTs go out and 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 look hopefully beyond that, um, mm. so that it it has efficacy greater than placebo, um, yeah, or, or, or greater plan. than you know treatment as usual or greater than waiting list because uh, mm-hmm. you know often these things you know have regression to the mean so if someone comes in at their lowest mm-hmm. we're going to find an improvement generally speaking at least on an average mm-hmm. um you know even with the waiting list so yeah you know, just through the course of life exactly mm-hmm. yeah and, and that's the tricky part in, in this domain compared to an oncology domain where I guess there are physical tests or biological tests that those clinicians can use in order to see that like, okay, cool, the the tumour is shrinking or, you know, this person is getting better from those sort of biological measures. Whereas, you know, ourselves in the mental health space or um, sort of the the developmental space, it's all observational. And that can, um, you know, even with the best, most reliable raters that we have out there, it can fluctuate day to day based on, you know, your participant and how they feel. Did it, was it a good night's sleep or, you know, did their little brother or little sister keep them up all night? And that's the reason why they're super irritable today. Um, we've run into instances where, you know, we've had assessments that have fallen on school holidays and st- school being a major stressor for these little people, you know, they're doing great. And that's got, you know, potentially nothing to do with the medication. It's just got everything to do with they can sleep in. They don't have to be here at a certain time. They don't have to wear a school uniform that they don't want to do. They can go and get a super duper from the freezer whenever they want to. Um, so yeah, in, in our space, without having those sort of overlapping mechanisms across context and potentially a, a biological assessment to sort of overlay with some of the parent reported stuff, it just makes life a wee bit more difficult. And is that what you rely on? mostly the, the 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 greatest tool that you got is self-report because that's what you're dealing with and that's what clinicians are dealing with they're they're talking to parents and kids and they're they're just obtaining self-report and we work with that you know so yeah is it more how often um and then we just record that as as the base of how well something's working correct it's you know the majority maybe 90 percent of the stuff we do are parent reported you know uh questionnaires and assessments um, in the handful of trials where we see kids with, you know, for example, you know, ret disorder and things like that, we will, you know, calculate seizure and seizure frequencies. So that's a bit of a, a biological measure there. But like I said, the majority is parent reported outcomes. As clinicians, we might do, you know, an ADOS to kick off with just to confirm inclusion criteria that they do meet DSM-5 to be included in the trial, but then we won't reassess you know, uh, autism symptomology at the end of the trial with another ADOS or anything like that. So, yeah, the majority of the efficacy outcomes are parent rated. And I guess the tricky bit is, I mean, we might be the experts in mental health or, you know, developmental disorders, but parents are the experts when it comes to their kids and they probably know their kids best. But, you know, the majority of these, these assessments aren't built for kids with disabilities. They're built for kids that are, I guess, developmentally on track, but they might have um, some issues with anxiety or, or low mood depression and those sorts of things. So if you think about, you know, the DASs, the ARCADs, the K10s, the more widely used ones, they rely on little people being able to express their emotions to some extent, whereas, you know, some of the kids we see are still nonverbal. Um, you know, they, they might be still, uh, not still, they might be wheelchair bound, so it's very hard to you know, assess their level of day-to-day functionality on some of these routine measures that um, are widely available in the public sphere. So one of the issues that we do run into is that applicability to these particular cohorts of some of these outcome measures that are, you know, widely used by the FDA and those sorts of other regulatory bodies. It makes it so hard to interpret the data because at that point, you know, there's so many variables that can account for it, you know, and it's a perfect example you know, even the recency effect, if, if, you know, on the way to the clinic, you know, the young person the day before had a bit of a mm-hmm. meltdown or something because, you know, maybe their sibling was frustrating and annoying and then something had happened at school. Mm. Um, all of a sudden you get greater reports because of the recency effect that, oh, you know, things are not improving and you know, it might be that on average they are, but it's difficult for us to report. Yeah. Um, you know, Particularly if there are they, time points where, that's kind of, um, you know, with, with the clinical trial protocols, you know, to go on to sort of those longer stages of those clinical trials, then participants, patients, they might need to show an effect that this is working. And so if those time points 
fall on a day that's not a good day for this little person and we don't have that data to back up the long-term benefit, it's just a cross-sectional look, you know, that might be the thanks, but no thanks, we're just going to have to pull the pin here for these little people. So that makes it really tough, uh, I guess, in a clinical trial setting to, you know, relay that information to mums and dads, definitely. Mm. And do mums and dads know when these uh, stages occur as to when they um, – uh, when the when the assessment of whether it continues or not is occurring, um, definitely that's a part of the informed consent process. So that's all documented and all that sort of other fun stuff. But I guess the way that these trials work is that nine times out of ten, there's sort of an RCT component that's front up uh, at, at the front end, and then once that component finishes, whether it's 14, 12, 16 weeks, um, patients if they want to can then graduate onto what we call an open label extension. And so that's when we know that they're not getting the placebo, they're getting, I guess, the, the active uh, medication compound ingredient, however you want to call it. So parents definitely know that, you know, if this particular protocol has an open label extension, then they'll be eligible for that. But then how long does that open label extension go for is a different story. You know, some are, you know, the best part of 12 months, some are 24 months. We've had one, uh, you know, our longest one now that's running into sort of four years. Um so it's just a little bit tricky to navigate that, you know, some protocols might not allow for an open label extension at all, um, which, you know, like you said, like we said in the informed consent process, we're super transparent to mums and dads that mm. if they come on board and it's an RCT without an open label extension, your little person might not get the good stuff. That's just unfortunately the way that the scientific method works. It's it's also challenging because my, my my initial thought before you, you uh, elaborated on that was, it also potentially creates a bias of parents saying, "Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's helping. It's definitely yeah, helping because we want, you know, yeah. yeah, we want you know little Keep little coming. Billy to continue to get you know support." And so, yep. um, <laughs> you know, it's so so complicated. It, it must be different, and I suppose hence why the research has to go on for you know decades to to yep. to, to, to you know actually get the science hopefully mm-hmm. straight, um, and even then often with a fairly modest benefit. Um, mm-hmm. you know, that they, none of these things are the holy grail, and we all know that because we've all been part of the medical system. And, and you know, once you've got something quite significant, more often than not, you know, it, it's not an easy fix. It, it, mm-hmm. it, it's a big, long process and, and, you know, often requires time and sometimes, um, you know, time is the the, the the healer. Other times it's, you know, time and the the medication you know we, we, we can never really you know gauge yeah, it on an individual basis but we can certainly do so um mm. you know on a population basis and that's how you know science is built mm. and that's why i think it's super important to continue the work that we do is just to sort of you know i guess medicinal cannabis cbd it's really in its infancy even though it's been around since you know the dawn of time essentially i think that um our director honey hoistler um when she's giving these presentations she's got a slide um, that includes sort of, you know, the, I think it's Cannabis Invicta, or I'm not how you sort of, not sure how you pronounce it properly. And it's like, you know, from early times, black and white photos and, and those sorts of things. So it's been around for ages. It's just now that we're suddenly starting to potentially see its its benefits and, and going backwards to go forwards, essentially, to get sort of the science around it, what it is good for, what it's not good for, um, you know, what benefit it might serve in you know an asd cohort versus a you know an epilepsy cohort versus healthy adults um these are really you know questions that we're yet to answer um so i think that you know it, it's an exciting space to be a part of most definitely um and it's one that i guess will continue to, to grow and grow both in the you know the medical field but also uh, on the corporate side i'd imagine with you know people wanting to potentially invest and make money and, and those sorts of things as well the business side of it and what are the benefits that we're hoping for? Because you know anyone that, that has gone out, for example, and and looked looked at the you know amphetamine you know drug class, you know we, mm-hmm. we see that's obviously a stimulant, so we expect that people become you know more alert or more focused depending on dosage and and so on. But it can provide energy. Mm-hmm. You know what is the anticipated benefit that cannabis brings um, or, you know, the CBD uh, component brings? 
essentially, we don't know. Um, this is what the science is trying to work out is like um, if it if it's effective and it benefits people, how is that the case? Um, and it's, I guess, a, a, a space that's continuously moving very quickly and the science is growing, but it's still in its relative infancy. I think that, you know, the endocannabinoid system is one that was only discovered sort of in the last decade compared to, you know, the CNS and all the other sort of nervous systems that are about. So <clears throat> we've only just sort of realised that this system is in place and it takes care of a multitude of different, you know, uh, factors that the body uh, goes through and, and, and that sort of thing. So in terms of the benefits that we're trying to see, it, it could be endless. I guess for our, our particular trials and our cohorts, um, the main thing that we're looking at trying to reduce is things around irritability, things around anxiety. Um, what else is there? We haven't really dipped into any of the pain world just yet, but that's a big common feature of sort of the adult space is pain um, and, and PTSD and those sorts of things. But, you know, for our paediatric cohorts, it's definitely things around sort of irritability and anxiety. And what we think is that if our little people are less irritable and less anxious, then that will translate to sort of better day-to-day -day functioning. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with little people, I can imagine the the complexities of having a THC component are, you know, uh, probably in, in actual fact unethical because there's a developing brain, the neurology yep. is forming and so <coughs> on, and we don't want to be putting psychoactive components in in, in, in kids. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, not that, that that shouldn't be research, but I think um, at least on, on, on face value, it seems like a, a, an unethical and unreasonable, th you know, hypotheses to, to, to yeah. say there's efficacy there but for adults who might have a developed brain um do you feel that there is you know the potential that there's potential value in in adding to the cbd affect that the, the thc um the psychoactive component um you know in 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 some form to to because it might have some sort of efficacy in, in or value i suppose to to, to mm -hmm. people with whether it's pain whether it's end of life treatment whether mm -hmm. it's um you know depression anxiety PTSD. Mm -hmm. um how do you feel about that um i think there, there have been a couple of theories postulated with this thing called the entourage effect where it, the addition of something like thc means that the cbd can be i guess absorbed quicker or more potent uh, throughout the body system um, so th that's one that's been postulated I'm not sure what the evidence is on that sort of entourage effect um, we can see that a lot of the products or a lot of the, the pharma companies have come out with I guess um, a balanced uh, product which is sort of a, a CBD and THC sort of in a 50-50 formulation or potentially you know a THC dominant product um, as opposed to what we were speaking about before which is a purely CBD or a CBD dominant product um, and in those instances, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what the literature says and, you know, we'd have to look at the evidence behind that, but I know that there are sort of other clinical trials in, in different areas for different ailments that are on, ongoing, including the a THC component um, for potential, you know, benefit or efficacy for those, you know, adults out there. I think for us in the paediatric setting, like I said, it's a hard and fast no, um, but for adults that kind of, you know, are, looking at alternatives or um, trying to look at different ways to sort of um, alleviate their symptoms, then the, it, it could be an option for them, but it'd be, you know, a horses for courses instance as well. And, you know, the people running those trials, they would have to definitely be, you know, super upfront about the potential cons involved with, you know, products containing THC. I'm asking because it almost starts to lean into that other space of, you know, psychedelic assisted you know, therapies where it's in actual fact the, um, or at least my novice view on uh, or understanding of this, it, it, it's the psychoactive components that we're trying to, um, you know, leverage. And, and mm. you know, obviously from a psychedelic perspective, there's probably, you know, there's the, the seeking of that mystical experience that then allows people to kind of, you know, uh, go beyond their, their ego and, and start, mm. you know, relating to, their life and memories and experiences and, and, and self in, in such a different way that, you know, potentially helps them, mm. um, you know, for example, with, you know, end of life sort of treatment for people to come to a space of acceptance, which is 
awfully painful and difficult. You know, for, for a lot of people, they never actually achieve that. And, mm. and I believe there's some studies that have um, you know, shown great efficacy in, in trying to um, elicit that response and have achieved um, that response, you know, and how widely that's been researched. I, I don't know, but, uh, you know, uh, for, for me, I'm just linking those two spaces mm. of, you know, some type of psychoactive um, ingredient uh, and how that could be efficacious for whatever the presenting problem is. Well, I just think it's great that we're starting to see a bit of a change in perspective that, you know, there could be something here that's going to help these particular patients or these particular cohorts. So it's worthwhile investigating as opposed to previously sort of, you know, fobbing it off or not even, you know, doing your due diligence just to see if there's, you know, anything of any benefit for people in that space. Um, Because I think with that sort of attitude, it just, we sort of shun people away to sort of, okay, if you want to do it, then it's going to be on your own and we're not going to take any responsibility for what does or doesn't happen. Um, And you kind of really isolate them in that regard. Whereas I guess the the changing of the perspectives um, and, you know, being a, a part of the medicinal cannabis and CBD space for the best part of five years now, we can even see some of the, shall we say, older heads in the medical com- community really coming around to the idea that this could be something worthwhile for, for their cohorts or their patients that, you know, has a great safety profile uh, that might serve, you know, their little people or their older people uh, a, a great benefit. In, in, uh being a type of class of drug, what, what do we expect is going to, you know, be the general affect? Is, is, is it, and I know obviously we're splitting it between THC and CBD, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we're looking more at the relaxant side, but then there's the kind of psychoactive side. So it's kind of like a muscle. Yeah. I don't know if it works that way and maybe you can form it. Is it more of a muscle relaxant on, on that biological, but on the psychological it's activating or, or um you can tell that i you know haven't uh you know dabbled in the world of, 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 of uh, you know marijuana but but, it, but it's interesting oh, mate, the, the neurobiology is a steep learning curve for um, i guess a psychologist when it comes to these sorts of things as well so it, it's hard yeah. to kind of learn through books as well right and, and and i know that you know often it's helpful to understand something like you know as much as i'd be terrified to do lots of things a part of me would be excited to you know maybe have a course where you can under supervision go through all the different classes of drugs and so on to understand what does this give people so i can get into the you know you know, uh, into the skin of clients when they, mm. you know, experiencing something. I mean, I can comfortably go out and understand when someone says, you know, I drank alcohol and I felt X, you know, mm-hmm. or, you know, as a young person, I, you know, used alcohol in this way. And if I used it in the same way, I feel at least I've got some understanding. Now, obviously, you know, that doesn't apply to PTSD because I can't sit in the, you know, the shoes of, but, yeah. uh, you know, they, these seem like they're accessible as a one-off use or something to to try and understand what is this mm. what does this mean or what's the um you know the the the, the component because at the moment a lot of this feels like it's you know these are just avoidance behaviors when it comes to illicit drug use you know that, mm. that to to try and diminish pain or to try and cope with 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 distress and the like mm-hmm. you know there's the addictive side there's impulsivity and 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 so on um but you know when we're starting to try and you know, postulate and formulate and think about what could the benefits be i can imagine that that uh having an understanding of you know how cannabis can help someone um yeah. you know through experience could could potentially help with you know even hypothesizing but maybe that's how this has come about there's plenty of other you know <laughs> professionals who have done so in, in, yeah, in their correct. lives and, you, and, and this is where you it comes think from. about you know our job as psychologists you know and under other mental health health therapists is kind of you know what is this action what need is it meeting for our client or our patient um and you know potentially under supervision with you know uh, experiencing some of these things maybe we get to identifying what that need is a lot quicker than sort of building rapport and sort of, you know, going through our formulation and our questions and, and those sorts of things. So, you know, I agree, but at the same time, um, it could be a very slippery slope. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, in actual fact, ju- just talking this through, I mean, I, I, I think it's actually quite silly what I said now on, on reflection, because once again, it would purely be an antidotal experiment. 
right? So it well, wouldn't actually say anything. You know, we would, yeah. we'd have to abandon that one experience anyway and go back to to research. So it makes no sense to to say, you know, I want to do an you know n equals one experiment and and learn something. It's probably not going to you know work that way. Oh, mate, there's probably some fancy statistician or, you know, study design person that will weave in a crossover in your N of one and we can go back and forth and, you know, we can get some power uh, done that way. But, um, yeah, I'm not sure who would fund it or, you know, what ethics board would okay that, but I mean, power to <laughs> That crosses over a little bit to 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 looking at, you know, research methods and, and um you know, part of the great challenge th- th- these days is also research that is produces something or is sexy or, or, or you know, um, has as great headlines. Um, yeah. How how do you you know control against against that? Because obviously, as you said, there are commercial <clears throat> um, interests uh, in this space. Um, you know, and as human beings, we want to be doing something that that produces you know an outcome and unfortunately we don't tend to celebrate uh outcomes that say this is not beneficial uh Mm -hmm. you know for x we we we, Mm -hmm. for whatever reason you know celebrate that it is effective in this and so this is why we see people fudge Mm -hmm. numbers and do you know grab a particular statistical analysis that that you know is extremely second rate um, yeah. but it's still producing the, the same data. result at yeah. least from a headline perspective <clears throat> um how, how does it work i mean obviously you're in a you know considerable uh, uh facility and 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 the like so I'm, I'm assuming there's a lot, lot more checks and balances but how how do you see that 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 world kind of monitoring itself mm-hmm. the the gift and the curse of being in the sort of you know stuck in between the, the health and the corporate sort of realms is that um, the I guess the a, nu- a null result or a, something that doesn't benefit um, you know a particular cohort or did not alleviate or reduce a particular symptom sometimes is just as valuable guess, as, as a significant <clears throat> result and and what we see is that um, you know from the, the corporate or the business side if they do get a result where they thought it would improve but it didn't they're very quick to sort of put a stop to things and you know pull whatever investment or capital they may have put into that sort of program and, and then sort of shift it elsewhere. So I think from a, a corporate side that they know that um, it's not a linear sort of path and that there's going to be bumps and bruises along the way. Um, the, the tricky part is sometimes letting these, you know, these families know that, you know, this this particular trial won't be continuing or this one's actually stopping it in, in those situations. So, I mean, we've had to do that a couple of times and in those situations, I think families have understood that maybe, you know, the, the benefits that they thought they may have seen, um, they haven't materialised and, and that's some of the reasons as to why uh, we're having to, to sort of cease the, the trial at that particular time. I mean, that's that, that's important of informed consent to say this could be pulled at any minute and so you yeah. could be in the middle of your trial and um, it ceases. Yeah. Uh, you know, with, with and, it, and it goes both ways. It, it could be that, you know, Australia, which is often the case, we lag behind our American and European, you know, counterparts in, in sort of uh, trials getting off the ground and, and looking um, and seeing if this particular product is beneficial. So um, in some instances, uh, it's sort of been approved and then brought to market a lot quicker than what it, they thought was originally. And so, you know, things have stopped because it's now approved and, and widely available. Do the... Do the uh... Does the research that has a you know null result uh, get um, published? You know, is that is that actively still put into a paper and and, and put forward, um, or is it just added to a database? How does that world work? You know, from a knowledge exchange, so that other people can hopefully not continue to follow a path that hasn't deemed the result. Or we can see a collection of you know mm-hmm. you know thirty five different. Uh, trials have done the same thing and they've all come up with a null result so we can kind of comfortably say that's actually a, a null result it's not just been you know yeah a one uh, an early pull because mm. you know uh, you know the fear of losing any more money on on that you know mm. uh, took precedent and, and that's one of the other tricky parts of the world that we live in is that because they're sponsored uh clinical trials is that the the sponsor owns the data 
And so it's really up to their discretion whether or not they wish to publish, uh, whether the result's positive or, or, or negative. It's really, you know, uh, their choice. I think that, um, you know, as a health professional and not a business person, I'm not sure how this all works, but I think that they're, regardless of what the outcome is, they have to, you know, put a presentation or a report together that might go to their investors or their shareholders and whatnot around the things that have or haven't happened. And it's sometimes within those press releases, there'll be details of, of clinical trials that have gone well or not done well. Um, but in terms of, I guess, knowledge sharing and scientific publications, I'm not quite sure where that all sits. But, you know, if they weren't to publish uh, their data or their findings, I think it would be, you know, a, a really grave waste of, uh, you know, the inability to share that knowledge with other people. As a, as a psychologist and obviously a researcher, where where do you think this space is going to land? What 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 do you think happens? You know, whether it's in Australia or globally, and obviously I'm not going to hold you to it. This is purely kind of projections, but, <laughs> but you know, being a little bit more on the um, uh, you know, on the uh, pointy end of this and and conducting it and seeing how it works and how. Mm you know, um, sponsors uh, invest and, and, and the like. Um, where do you think this, um, you know, how, how, do, how do you think it plays out? I think that from... And from time life, frames. Give me some time frames because I'm interested oh, to, just to hear. And obviously this is ballpark. We're just kind yeah. of, you know, in, well, enjoying if, if ourselves we, here. If we think about like the clinical trials sort of game broadly, I think that oncology and, and cancers, they still sort of uh, at sort of first and second on the, you know, the the number of clinical trials listed by the FDA or on clinicaltrials.gov, they're one and two. And I think um, behavioural or developmental disorders, which is where our sort of, you know, our unit sits and what we do as psychologists, I think we were batting like, you know, at least 17 or 18 down the list. And sort of in the last decade, I think we're up to about five or six so what I think is we're seeing is that um, some of the sponsors or those big corporate entities are, are looking at sort of gaps in the market of which, you know, neurodevelopmental disorders have sort of not got any attention sort of in the last sort of 15 to 20 years of, of you know, a need that needs to be met. And they're sort of looking at, well, how can we sort of, you know, develop something or produce something that might meet that need, but also you know, increase our bottom line or make some people happy and, and those sorts of things. So I, I think that clinical trials for behavioural neurodevelopmental disorders are only going to go north. I don't think they're going to go south. I think we're going to see lots more players in the market. And I think that what we'll find is that the, the aim of these trials will move from symptom management, irritability, anxiety, those sorts of things to potential sort of curative treatments in terms of, for example, genetic disorders and how that sort of may play out into the future with advances in technology, um, how we can sort of isolate or synthesise a particular gene and see, well, that's the faulty one. Maybe if we swap that out for something else, um, it, it may cure this particular illness or, or whatnot. So I, I think that's the sort of realm that we're heading towards. Um, and I dare say in sort of the next 10 years, um, it's going to look drastically different in terms of, you know, if you have a young person that's got a genetic condition, what your options are in terms of moving forward. Is it something that, you know, you may look to a curative treatment for or is it something that you're just looking at sort of managing some of those seizures, managing some of those outbursts, managing some of that irritability? Um, but obviously that's just for those genetic conditions that we know where to look for and, and what we may find. Um, moving, I guess, forward. So still feels that the biological space will, will more than likely come with regards to, you know, some of the oncology um, uses uh, that might be a little bit probably easier to study as well because we're just asking, you know, are you having less pain? Are you mm -hmm. having better better quality of life? You know, can you function in your, in your you know, daily living better? By using mm. product X, and it's a little bit harder to 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 get the data as clear um, from the you know neurodevelopmental side because there's so many extraneous factors and and and, and we're, we're, we're we're you know having to control for a lot more things or at least trying to do stronger correlations that mm. is harder to do. Yeah, um, 
but unless it's we on have the a rise. massive a massive cohort or a massive sample size. Um, which you know, for our ASD cohorts, you know, there's enough numbers there. But in terms of, I guess, our rare genetic conditions, where you know we're looking at prevalence rates of like you know one in forty thousand, one in fifty thousand live births, then you know to try and you know do a very you know well powered study in those in those cohorts is extremely difficult. Mm, just don't have the numbers. I I remember my friend going through you know quite a number of clinical trials in actual fact i think he went through maybe three of them um mm. uh, in his in his um uh, in his journey uh, and you know they just kept throwing it at him and, and eventually got to a point saying kind of saying there's nothing else we can kind of provide mm-hmm. um uh, but uh you know there was lots of different things which which was in actual fact great because it provided lots of hope Mm-hmm. as well you know and and, and something to cling on to and lots of you know fight so even even the medical side even that was very painful because you end up in and out of hospital but that's that's just the reality right of the um, condition yeah uh, but it, it gave him something to cling on as well um mm-hmm. so it's not just about whether we find that final cure even for those people today you know it gives them something to 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 cling on to while they're going through that journey and yeah obviously hardship can come from from that as well but uh i mean i, I can see that there's a great challenge with with, with trying to get the participants because it's not very readily um marketed you know to yeah. say hey if you've got a child with you know you know epilepsy come into this mm-hmm. trial you know it's more probably about the clinicians finding um or, or coming across you know um uh, clients and then going out and saying hey have you thought about this and then referrals coming that way because you know mm-hmm. because obviously in oncology all day every day sadly mm-hmm. um there are willing participants and, and that's the beauty of what our colleagues in oncology and the leap we can take out of their book is that they've embedded their clinical trials within their sort of uh clinical load so you know at any one time if this person is diagnosed with this particular cancer cool they, they have these options uh, you know, in front of them and they can make a choice from there or they can do, you know, treatment as usual, whatever that looks like for that particular condition. But I guess for, you know, ourselves as psychologists and we can expand this to, you know, our colleagues in medicine, whether it be, you know, psychiatry or neurology or, you know, even our friends in social work, counselling, you know, if they're dealing with clients day in, day out with particular, you know, developmental conditions or, or whatnot and um, we're able to sort of, you know, market or leverage you know our name to say well these options are available then you know maybe some of the um benefit or or the good work that we can do can be more widely spread and and opportunities for participation can be you know increased um and i see that as one of the missions of our center here definitely trying to you know increase or promote uh, clinical trials in this space because they are there they are available it's just sometimes really tricky to get the word out if people did want to follow up and find out more, you know, about this space, the trials that you guys are doing, you know, your 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 center as well, where can they go to and and um, you know, read up further, um, you know, potentially connect, engage. So our center is run out of the Queensland Children's Hospital. So if you visit their homepage and click on research, you should be able to find the Center for Clinical Trials in Rare Neurodevelopmental Disorders. Uh, and on that page, you've got a list of, I guess, our team mem- members, including my lovely self, uh, the trials that we're currently conducting and what we're recruiting for. Uh, and they range, you know, from ASD, Fragile X, uh, Rett syndrome, Angelman syndrome, um, Ticks and Tourette syndrome. Um, and it's not just in the medicinal cannabis field we've expanded. So we have a handful of other, I guess, experimental medications that may be available there. So um, I'll make sure to send you a link to pop in at the end for anyone that wants to click on and, and get in contact uh, with our centre from there. And what would you say to to those, you know, parents in particular who are, you know, a little bit apprehensive about, you know, going on a trial and, and what this all means, you know, what, what would you, you know, communicate with them about what, what you guys do and, and, and why this is, um, you know, something they might want to consider? Mm. Uh, first things first, I entirely understand why you would be apprehensive to, you know, come in and, and, and see us and, and, and look at the clinical trials and, and see what we're about. So 
we entirely understand that sort of apprehension and that aspect to us. But, um, you know, we, we're a research unit, so there's nothing, um, how do I put this? Like, you don't have to do this. All our consent forms say upfront, big, bold text that you don't have to do this. It's okay to say no. There's definitely no pressure or no expectations. Um, you know, the centre has been doing this for the best part of five years now. We have a complete wraparound team in terms of medical psychology, nursing, study coordination, pharmacy, phlebotomy. Um, we sort of, it's a, we try to build ourselves as a one-stop shop. Um, you know, if you want to come and visit us here, you know, we sort out parking, we do all sort of that fun stuff to make it as, as super simple and breezy for you to come and visit us at our site. Um, we've had the pleasure of, you know, families visiting from all over Australia um, for some of our trials. We are the only site within Australia to service them. So, you know, people have come across from WA, down from NT, uh, up from South Australia. Um, so we try and, you know, uh, spruik and build ourselves as, as, you know, a great, you know, family clinical trials unit. I'm currently in our room here uh, for those that might be viewing us. So this is what it looks like. So if you come in and visit us, it might be a little bit familiar. But in terms of, like I said, expectations or pressure, uh, there is none, honestly. Um, we're just, you know, uh, clinicians uh, at heart. We want, you know, what's best for, you know, our patients, our cohorts and that sort of thing. So, you know, if you do want to reach out and, and see what we're about, we're more than happy to have a conversation or, you know, send you through some information. Uh, our consent forms are horrendously long. Um, then they're, they're not uh, enthralling of a read at all. So, you know, nine times out of ten, it's best to have a conversation with us about, you know, what your little person is experiencing and how a clinical trial may or may not be of best service to them. Michael, thank you so much for, you so for, much. for your time. Um, you know, I think what you just said as well and, you know, certainly what's come through our conversation today is, is you know, that this is a real genuine attempt of trying to understand, you know, what's going to work you know irrespective of whether we're talking about cannabis or, or any other product and obviously you know splitting between thc and cbd is important but um you know it comes from a very non-biased approach you know this is a, a best practice you know evidence-based you know model looking at trying to do proper research methodology um you know and that this isn't you know, something to be fearful of uh, at the same time no strong promises are being made. It's, it's saying we're trying to figure out what's going to work for little people. And you know, if we can help with whether it's epilepsy or ASD or add data to, to the collection to hopefully make tomorrow a better day, um, you know, then you're interested and, and there isn't a you know, bias you know, that of, of you know, wanting it to work other than from a compassionate sense. It's not a commercial. It's just saying let's do it because – when we can get this over the line, we can actually give it out to, to the masses as a, as an option. You know that still may or may not work, but it, it'll be an, another tool toolkit, uh, or you know, it'll be another tool in our toolbox to to provide for you know, obviously you know, desperate and and, and loving mm -hmm. parents. So and obviously you know, suffering children. So. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your time and the work that you do. I really appreciate you and and, and the team there. And, uh, you know, I hope you guys continue to get plenty of funding and, and do your work because we need, you know, as much of this uh, thrown at it, particularly in such a complex space that that has, you know, lots of extraneous variables. So it makes it very hard, but, you know, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to try. So, yeah, thanks. Mate, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Um, it's been an absolute blast. So, yeah, uh, again, thank you. Very humbling. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review. Subscribe, share it via social media, and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources. And just lastly, if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team, develop your experience and get into some exciting work, come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out. I'd love to hear from you.